Hello friends, welcome to Finding Ohm. That is A-U-M, Awareness, Understanding, and Mastery, a podcast about combining mental health and spirituality to live a more meaningful life. This podcast is hosted by me, Dr. Prashant Sharma, a psychiatrist, and someone who wants to bridge the gap between spirituality and science. Enjoy the show. I'm very excited for today's episode. I will be interviewing best-selling author Stephen Hawley Martin. He has written about various topics, including near-death experiences, which, as you guys know, I enjoy discussing, the afterlife, reincarnation, and so much more. He has more than uh, 140 books in print. He had his own weekly podcast called The Truth About Life from 2007 through 2009 and averaged more than 30,000 downloads per episode. Stephen, I want to thank you for agreeing to speak with me on the Finding Own podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it, too. Thank you for having me here. Oh, glad. Glad to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really excited uh, to talk with you today. When, when I was looking over your information online and, uh, you know, immediately I wanted to bring you onto the show because of your interests and your expertise in these areas, given the amount of research you've done and, and the people you've interviewed over the years uh yeah yeah some interesting people no question about it yeah <laughs> let's do it awesome yeah yeah so i wanted to start off by asking about a actually personal experience you've talked about before um i was listening to your interview on uh passion for the paranormal and you were explaining how many years ago uh i think you had the flu and you had this very interesting experience which sparked your interest in these topics i was wondering if you could recount that for us you know i'd be happy to yeah yeah that that's uh really what started me on this journey of uh just trying to discover what the true nature of reality is and what life is all about and why we're here and all that and uh it it i was uh, about 25 years old i lived in baltimore I understand you live in Baltimore too. So uh, I was up uh, on Bolton Hill and in an old townhouse. I lived there with uh, two other bachelors. And I was upstairs in my bedroom on a Saturday night. It was uh, unusual for me to be in my bedroom on Saturday night at uh, seven or eight o'clock at night. And uh, I had the reason was that I had a terrible case of the flu. I, it was I was really very very ill and I uh, I was trying to read a book I remember I was reading uh, uh, Metamorphosis which I never finished reading I think I got to the part where the main character was turning into a cockroach or something and I heard uh, <laughs> I heard uh, some people coming in downstairs into the uh, into the living area and uh, pretty soon there were more people coming in and there was kind of this din of a party going on down there and I thought my goodness here I am upstairs here in this bed you know nursing this flu and feeling bad I, I bet you know I'll just I'll just go down there and and uh, maybe I'll feel better so I got out of bed and I put on some clothes and I, but I really was not feeling well at all and I went down stairs and uh, sure enough big party going on and uh, I had some drinks and I had some smokes and I had, uh, you know, some conversations and pretty soon I just felt, I felt like I couldn't stand up. I, I felt, you know, it just came over me and I somehow managed to get back up to my bedroom and flop down on the bed and, uh, and, and it was like it started spinning. And I was like the blade of a helicopter that was taken off, you know. And uh, and suddenly, it was it's like my chest expanded and my body, and I just sort of popped. And I, the next thing I knew, I was looking down at myself from the ceiling and saw my body on the bed. And it reminded me of roadkill, just sprawled out there, and uh, and and I. Th I felt calm. I was no longer, didn't feel bad. I felt, you know, didn't really feel anything. I just felt very calm. And I looked down and I thought, you know, wait a minute. I'm up here and that's my body down there. How can that be? And I have to pause here and tell you that I was brought up in a very uh, scientifically minded family. I guess my parents were 
what I would today call scientific materialists, although, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they might go to church on Christmas or Easter or something, but it, they were not religious at all. And I, of course, went to all the way through school and studied science, and just as still as the case today, they were teaching scientific materialism, and I bought into all that. So I believed that uh, that I was my body and that uh, my consciousness was created by my brain and you know like when you die it's like pulling the plug on a vacuum cleaner psh, it's it's over that's what i thought and then when i'm up there uh just very calmly looking down at my body i'm thinking how can that be i'm, I'm up here this is my consciousness and uh, my body's down there my brain's inside that head my brain must not create my consciousness <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I uh, it didn't last very long. It wasn't the full blown uh, uh, after you know near death experience that you hear about, where you go through the tunnel and you go to the light and you have a after uh, life review and you might meet certain relatives or whatever they've gone before. All those things that anybody who's read about uh, near death experiences knows about. It was pretty quick, probably lasted, I, mean, I don't really know how long it lasted, maybe it lasted 30 seconds, maybe it was five minutes, maybe it was 10, I don't know. But at some point I just kind of, things went dark and the next thing I knew it was uh, the mo Sunday morning. And I was feeling a whole lot better than I did before and I was back in my body. But it was a profound ex experience in the sense that uh, it did wake me up to the uh, the fact that things weren't the way I thought they were, and that started me on <clears throat> on this journey, as I said earlier. And uh, I read everything I could about metaphysics. I joined the Rosicrucian Society and studied their material and all the secret stuff you're supposed to learn. They really do kind of know what's going on. Like, it's it's a, a little more complicated than it needs to be, but. Uh, I think they're pretty close to the re reality. But anyway, that's what happened, uh, Prashant, and uh, so here I am. <laughs> it's fascinating, yeah. Uh, no, that that um, story in itself and the experience, so it sparked your journey. And, you know, it's interesting. It reminds me of um, uh, way back years ago, I was reading a book uh, by this uh, uh, Tibetan monk, and he was explaining uh, this this similar experience where they would actually meditate on the rooftop of their monastery in the in the uh, you know deep cold right of winter, and they would do that because they would be able to detach from their bodies more easily when they're in that much discomfort. Um, so it's kind of reminded me of that because you were in so much discomfort having the flu and you know everything that was going on and that you sort of just popped out, as you said, you know, and it sort of reminded me of that, like the Tibetan monks who intentionally kind of put themselves into discomfort so they think that so that they can pop out, sort of. I can see why they would do that, because, <laughs> you know, as I said, I was fe feeling horrible, yeah. spinning and all that. And then when I was popped out, it was like calm, you know, no real feeling, physical feeling at all. So if, I could imagine if it was 20 below zero, I would feel cold. <laughs> I had nothing, no, you know, nerves or whatever for that to go through. Yeah. So, yeah, I had another experience later on. I uh, do talk about it in one of my books, probably about 10 years later, mm -hmm. where I was meditating. And wow. I was in, I was in my, uh, I, I'd gone through all the Rosicrucian stuff. I'd read a lot about metaphysics. And I was in my backyard. It was a beautiful uh, late spring day, probably 72 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, uh, I was lounging on a on a kind of a chaise lounge, and uh, just in a perfect kind of setting and meditating, and suddenly I felt my consciousness. I guess I would say expand, mm. and I could see auras around the trees and the flowers and the grass. And it continued to the point where I felt as though I, I merged with what I would call the, uh, the uh, 
universal consciousness. You know, I, I could think about something and I would have the answers. It was like I knew it. It was like it was part of my memory or my brain or my, you know, what was already there in my head. And, and I had all these uh, sort of revelations. I didn't bring it all back with me, but I brought enough of it back to, with me to know that uh, uh, today I believe that there is a, a universal mind that we're all part of, that we're all connected to. Uh, we mostly stay in our ego minds and uh, every once in a while we'll dredge up something from our subconscious, but uh, we're really connected all the way through. And if we can meditate, sometimes we can we can get in touch with that. But that was a very, that was as profound a, an experience as the earlier one, the short one that just kind of woke me up to the fact that our that we're not our bodies, we're we're our our minds, our souls, whatever it is that uh, is uh, eternal. I believe. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's oh, that's an amazing experience. I'm so glad you told us about that. That that is uh, profound. It's it's like um, it, it's kind of like so you reach that state through meditation, and I know like with um, uh, uh, people do this with psychedelics where they have this. Uh, dissolving of their ego right um as, you, as you're saying i think it must be i've not not never uh taken psychedelics i you know sure. when i was younger i had marijuana if you uh, but uh, not that that doesn't do it <laughs> I've never had LSD or whatever that uh, that creates that kind of an experience but i think it probably is the same thing sure. and uh you know it's once you've had it you'd like to go back to it because it is um so profound and such a feeling you know love and all that stuff that you that people talk about it's true and uh, but I've never that's the only time it really ever happened to me and uh, I do still meditate some and I like to go on long walks in nature and kind of feel part of it uh, I guess I'm become sort of a pantheist in that <laughs> regard uh, I think that life is in everything and and all life is uh, that part of that mind that I was talking about that uh, and it's you know the the what life is doing it's becoming it, that's mm -hmm. what the urge of life is is to become and that's what we've been doing you know for 3.77 billion years since life first uh, appeared on earth is becoming uh, and we you know we homo sapiens have maybe reached the top of the or at least we're at the top of the pyramid at this point but we've still got a long long way to go long sure way. <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely um so yeah I, I wanted to ask you like where do you think uh consciousness resides in that case you know i, I mean i think consciousness my theory is, and, and I've talked to several, uh, you mentioned the podcast I had for about three years, and I uh, did an hour podcast a week, and uh, often would have uh, scientists on uh, who were studying this sort of thing, and particularly quantum physicists. And quantum physicists will tell you that there really isn't such a thing as matter the way I believe that uh, scientific materialists think of it. That's really a 19th century idea. Uh, as uh, Einstein's theory, uh, you know, his uh, famous formula, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. There really is only energy. Everything is energy and everything is connected that way. Uh, the philosophical message of uh, of quantum physics is that all is one. And that's something that uh, mystics have been saying for thousands of years. And I think the basis of everything is that energy. But I think the next thing that comes from it is consciousness. And uh, so that consciousness really is, energy is the ground of being, consciousness comes from energy and that's what's next. And then everything else comes from that. When you think about it, we don't experience anything uh, firsthand. It all comes through our senses. And so we've never really experienced matter uh, firsthand. It's, it's all in our consciousness. And so I kind of picture 
reality as uh, the, a, a mind. I think there was a quantum physicist uh, back in the 30s, 20s or 30s, who said uh, reality is it's beginning to look more like uh, a, a giant thought in which we are all participating. And, and that's kind of the way I see it. I think that reality is that mind and we are all parts of that mind. We're like little whirlpools inside this uh, this larger uh, mind that is everything, that is the universe. And, and there are many dimensions, many places that uh, that are, you know, that we when we leave our bodies uh, at some point, we'll be able to go to visit some of those places. <laughs> but uh, that, that's, so I think that to answer your question, where is consciousness? Consciousness is everywhere. Conscious even uh, in, a, in a hunk of metal, uh, down at the very surface of that where all the little quarks and, and electrons and things are flying around is consciousness creating all that. So that's kind of where I come out. Wow, wow. Yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's a beautiful way of uh, looking at the universe, I think. And it, it resonates a lot with me, for sure. It's very similar. I don't know. Uh, are you from India? Oh, oh, close. I'm from Nepal. Nepal. Because yeah. I think the uh, the Hindu ideas, the Verdas, mm -hmm. are probably very close to what uh, to quantum physics in that sense that that everything comes from this ground of being that I guess is is in I guess Verda means information, but. It's awareness or consciousness, and everything comes from that. I think it's a very, they're probably close, is very close to have figured it out 5,000 years ago. The Ricci's, I guess they were called. Yeah, I definitely, I, I believe that for sure. Um, it's, you know, when going back and reading some of those texts, uh, it, it's it's rather scientific <laughs> in a lot of ways, you know, and and talking about like awareness and mindfulness and meditation and all these things. And uh, yeah. uh, I think you're absolutely uh, right. Yeah. I talked to one quantum physicist who, who really drew a parallel between his theory of the, of the, or the sign, the quantum physics theory of the uh, unified field and Verda and how the different stages that it goes through to create reality really parallel what the Rishi's, uh, we're saying using different words so yeah, absolutely amazing amazing so uh, i also wanted to ask you about um you know you've interviewed so many people on um the topic of near-death experiences and uh i have i have a lot of listeners who love you know the 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 topic in itself uh near-death experiences uh, i know this is a broad question so feel free to like make me specify it a little bit more but what were some of the most fascinating things you heard or things that like changed your viewpoints uh, or, or reaffirmed your viewpoints or anything like anything that was really uh, uh, fascinating in those experiences? Yeah. One of the first things that comes to mind and there certainly uh, are, you know, many really kind of very interesting stories that come out of that, but is the shared death experience where, uh, someone uh, will be doesn't all they don't always have to be in the room with the person who's dying but often they are at the bedside of the of the person who is uh, dying and when they when they die the loved one sees the same things that the uh, dying person experiences and kind of goes with them for part of the way <laughs> into the tunnel, you know, to see the grandmother or whoever it is that's, that's coming to meet them. And uh, to me, that's fascinating. That that's a fairly uh, that that shows to me or demonstrates. And I guess the reason I bring it up is you asked about you know what has changed my opinion. It, it just didn't change it, but it solidifies the idea that we're all connected. That we're all part of the same mind if i if my mother or father or grandmother is dying and i uh, accompany them at the bedside and when they pass i kind of join them take them go part of the way with them and see that vision that they have and the 
light and, and the tunnel and, and so forth, it, it, it shows to me that we're, you know, we're, we've got a shared mind at that point. So it must be really always that way. We just uh, stick most of the time in our egos and you know, our egos manage to get us in a lot of trouble if we can. Uh, <laughs> that's one of the things I've tried to do over the years is, is not listen to my ego. Uh, and to really try to get in touch with that, what I call the uh, uh, silent observer that's at the back mm. of his mind, if you, if you can get in touch with that. And kind of watch yourself. Watch yourself go, to, go about your day. And uh, watch yourself react to things that trigger you. And when those things that trigger you are probably telling you about stuff that you ought to that you haven't dealt with that you need to deal with. And you're a psychiatrist, so you know all that stuff. <laughs> no, it's, I, I love it. I love it. We don't, we don't talk about it enough, I think, in psychiatry and therapy, but that's, that's absolutely one of the things uh, I talk about with patients is um, let's try to put ourselves outside of ourselves, you know, and look at our reactions because very frequently we'll automatically uh, have reactions during the day that we don't even realize, right? And, uh, but if we can have that observer position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much is on automatic pilot and uh, it doesn't have to be. As I said, you can, you can uh, position your awareness. I call it the back of my mind, but maybe it's up over my head a little bit over here <laughs> and just kind of watch myself go about my business. And it, it'll change the way you behave in, in a better way. You know, you won't, when you're reacting to something, it's because there's something that, that's in your, you know, maybe it was in your childhood, maybe it was, you know, something is causing that and you need to bring that out and take a look at it. And absolutely. Then, and you can let it go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And on the on the uh, topic you mentioned, shared death experiences, I'm fascinated by those uh, as well. Um, actually, it's interesting you mentioned that because a few days ago, uh, somebody had messaged me. Um, after watching one of the YouTube videos on uh, NDEs and uh, was talking about a shared death experience she had with her father uh, at the bedside. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think that proves it right there, like you said, that we are all connected uh, on that level. The other thing uh, that I found interesting, and not, this isn't so much shared death or near death, but mm -hmm. this fellow uh, Swedenberg, do you know about him? Oh, I don't. Sweden, uh, Swedenberg was a... A Swedish noble uh, back in the 18th century and he uh, apparently had a mystical experience in his 50s kind of like the one I, I described I, I assume but after that he was able to apparently uh, go back and forth between physical reality and non-physical reality and he uh, he wrote in Latin but all of, most of his works apparently have been uh, translated into English. And uh, he described all, uh, many of the different levels, he called them, of uh, the non-physical realm. And basically, his, uh, what he, if you boil down what he wrote, he sees, and you, of course, you know, seven is a uh, number that is a kind of a spiritual kind of number. Seventh heaven, all that sort of thing. Seven days of the week, you know, seven comes up a lot. And uh, basically, earth, uh, this physical reality, he puts in the middle with the three above and the three below. And uh, I just kind of found that fascinating. So... You know, if, if, you're, uh, if your listeners and viewers are interested in Swedenborg, there are a lot of videos on YouTube about him by, by scholars who have studied his works. And uh, it's, really, it's really pretty fascinating. I, I think there's, that he was on to something. I'm, I think there are probably a whole lot more than seven, seven different realms. I kinda, my feeling is that we probably go to whatever one, wherever it is that we feel comfortable with people other souls around us who are like us and uh, and we probably have a soul group that we're part of and so forth and I think he, he got into that a little bit but uh, 
imagine that back in in the 18th century, 1700s, uh, he was um, he was a tra traveler into the into the spirit realm. Very prominent guy who was a you know a lord or whatever it is in in Sweden. But um, anyway. Very, yeah. I'll, I'm definitely gonna look him up, and uh, and and like you said, uh, to be a lord, and I assume sort of more materialistic, right? If you're a lord, and you know you have uh, all this property and you know wealth, and for him to kind of go down that path is, is yeah, amazing. he was a very wealthy guy, and also a scientist. Before he had all these mystical experiences, he was very much into science, and mm. so he he was trying to bridge it just as you are bridge science and that's part of what i i would like to see happen is uh, i really think that uh, we're at a point where we need to discard uh, the materialistic scientific point of view it's just not it's there's so much evidence that it, that can't possibly be correct i mean just think about the uh, Think about the DNA molecule, and if you were to the double helix, you know, DNA molecule folded up in every cell of your body, if you stretch that stretch that uh, out, it'd be six and a half feet long, and it's all like computer code that's telling the, the body or the cell when to make uh, certain proteins and how to make them and all that stuff. It's like a computer program. Now, how did that happen by accident? Whereas if scientific materialism is correct, it had to have happened by accident. And it would have, uh, you know, they'll say, well, anything can happen given enough time. But the Earth formed 4.5 billion years ago and life came about 7, 3.7 or 8 billion years ago. So that is a limited amount of time for that to happen. And can you imagine rolling the dice and having heads come up uh, in a line that's six and a half feet long and little every one of the little uh, digits is so small you have to have a microscope to see it i mean it just doesn't make sense exactly no i agree with you completely uh for it to be all left up to chance i think is far-fetched you know and um it you know there's a uh, you've probably uh, uh seen his books dr uh bruce grayson um when he oh, wrote yeah. about yeah, near death experience. Oh, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. oh, and he yeah. talks about that. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going to say that I've, uh, I haven't interviewed Dr. Grayson, but I interviewed his colleague, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, what's his last name? He's the one who's taken over from Grayson oh. uh, at the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia. I've interviewed him twice, and he's written a number of books well, two or three books on. Reincarnation. Grayson, too. Grayson studied those near-death experiences more than anything else. And uh, there are a bunch of uh, YouTube videos with him, too. Uh, oh. People are interested. Yeah, Dr. Grayson. But go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted. No, no, not at all. No, that's but that's exactly it. He talks about how, you know, uh, uh, a lot of the scientific community would sort of turn a blind eye to the near-death experiences, you know, and say, oh, that's, you know, we can't really look at that. You know, we can't really... Uh, uh, you know, study it. You know, that's not something that's studyable. You know, and uh, uh, but yeah. it's, it's true, and it's true it's because it's their religion. You know, they've yeah. Uh, people have a way, and you know this probably better than anyone else as a uh, as a psychiatrist or counselor that people filter facts to and and uh, put a spin on them to so that they'll conform to beliefs that they already have you know they don't want to have to go through the effort of having to change their belief it's i i, I look at it as kind of like a uh you, if you ever see one of these pyramids on the aisle end of a grocery store where they've got all the products you know uh, built up and it's like you know each one holds the other one up and it, and it goes up in a pyramid and and if you take a core belief that's down at the bottom and you you pull it out the whole thing comes tumbling down and that's that's the way a lot of people's minds work they've got these core beliefs that if they uh, something comes along that that questions that and would change that if they really took it seriously 
uh, it would mean they'd have to rebuild that pyramid all the way up. And they just don't want to have to go through that effort, I guess. It's subconscious, of course, but they just dismiss facts that are right in front of them. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that 100%. That's, a, I guess, cognitive dissonance where they just can't reconcile these two things, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, an an another thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, you know, uh, you've written about um, uh, your belief that humankind is on the cusp of a transition to a new understanding uh, of the true nature of uh, reality. And I just wanted to ask you about that, you know. And, well, uh, I do. I, I, uh, that, that's definitely, and I think I mentioned it earlier, that uh, it's time to jettison this whole uh, ma uh, materialistic point of view so it's so um it, the cognitive dissidence that you mentioned is building up and i think it continues to build up and and the internet and youtube and all these podcasts that are available now are contributing to that because information that would have been uh put aside because it didn't conform to what uh, the, the traditional ideas about reality were now gets out there and more and more people are learning about near-death experiences and shared death experiences and reincarnation you know the the christian church uh has uh you know put that idea of of reincarnation down and what christians don't realize is that it was part of the Christian church for 500 years, up until 553 at the Second Council of Constantine, the Emperor Constantine demanded that reincarnation be removed from the uh, church canon because, I mean, I'm reading into why, but it's pretty obvious that you have a hard time controlling people and getting to them to toe the line when they think they're going to have a second chance. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so they took it out. They took it out of the canon, but uh, it was I did there. Not know that. Wow. Yeah, oh, yeah. And and you know there there are and I I, don't, I can get into it if you want, but there are passages in the Gospels where it's pretty obvious that Jesus and his disciples took reincarnation for granted. That it was you know ob, you know it was just part of the culture and part of wow. what people believed. So, for example, the easy one is uh, the disciples ask, his disciples ask Jesus, who, who do people say I am? And his disciples say, well, some people say you're John the Baptist, but others uh, believe that you're one of the prophets. Huh. Well, the last prophet died 400 years before Jesus was born. So if wow. he was one of the prophets, he had to have been one of the prophets reincarnated. And that's what they were talking about. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, amazing. Hey. But, uh, well, reincarnation is one of the things that demonstrates that, that memories and is, are not stored in the brain and that uh, the consciousness is not necessarily created by the brain. And that if, if a child can remember his past life, uh, where did those memories reside between when he was dead, you know, when his first previous body died and before he got the new one? Uh, and the University of Virginia, you mentioned, uh, oh, I know, it was Jim Tucker is the guy's name. Mm. Was, have studied this. They've got over over 2,500 uh, cases that they've studied, and they they have what they call solved over 1,700 of them where they have uh, taken what the child said about his previous life and found uh, the individual who fit all that description. Wow. And both time, place, uh, you know, siblings, uh, occupation, uh, cause of death, uh, the wife or husband of the person, all those things fit, 1,700 of them. Wow. Uh, they've been at it for a long time, you know, the, um, almost 60 years when it first started back in the 60s. It probably is that, 60 years now. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's all of that amazing. is getting out. And I think that at some point the dam is going to burst 
and it won't be too long. I, I hope it'll be in my lifetime. And I think it's starting now. I think really do think it's starting now. I, I hope so as well, like some kind of shift in consciousness. Like you said, the dam, I like that analogy, the, the dam bursting and just uh, we have this sort of global change, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I think once people realize that we really all are one. Yes. And that we are, uh, we're, what's the cliche? Um, we're eternal spiritual beings having, tempor having a temporary physical experience. <laughs> When that gets through people's heads, you know, it's going to change how they uh, behaved toward each other. Absolutely. It's got to, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that plus you're going to have a, you're going to have a life review. So if you go out and murder a whole bunch of people, that's, that's not going to be good for you when you get to that review. Absolutely. <laughs> I've talked to people who, uh, there was this one fellow who uh, had, uh, been in an automobile accident and a car pulled in front of him and crashed into him and he got so mad you know road rage he got out of the car and he beat up the uh, man who had been driving the car that ran into him uh, you know beat him unmercifully and to the point where the and, and I believe he was you know probably he was sued and went through all that uh, temporal uh, physical stuff but the man was unable to work afterwards wow. and when he had his near-death experience in his life review he said that he felt not only what that man felt not the physical but the the sorrow and the damage that was done to him psychically psychically and the but not only to the man but to his wife and his children and his and the descendants of his children everybody who was affected the wife who had to go to work to earn a living to to uh, support the family the children who weren't able to go to college because they didn't have enough money to do it because the husband couldn't work all of that sorrow that came about as a result of his uh, beating up that man he felt it in his life review and then he came back and he's a different person Wow. I talked to another, another man who had been a, uh, he, he was from Jamaica, had been in a gang and a really bad guy <laughs> and had a, uh, a past life review and his near death experience. And when he, when I talked to him, he was now a pastor oh. in, uh, in living in Tennessee that he had completely changed and, you know, become a very spiritual person. So, wow. Uh, yeah. That <laughs> think about that. You're gonna you're gonna feel the good and the joy that you create, and you're gonna feel the hurt and the sorrow, at least during the time you go through that past life review. That is a yeah. It seems fair, and you know I've, I've wondered I've wondered about that before. That maybe that life review is sort of a uh, maybe that's the purpose it serves. You know, it's sort of. Uh, you review it, you know, you sort of, um, you uh, experience the joy that you've created, but maybe it's sort of a hell in a way too, you know, that for some people who oh, yeah, have yeah, inflicted. That's absolutely right. It's, it's a teaching. Well, life on earth, and that's the other thing I've come to, is a, earth is a school. We come here to experience and learn. And, and when we, uh, when this life is over, we're going to review how we did and uh, we're going to learn from that and so maybe next time we'll we'll do a better job <laughs> unfortunately we come back in we most of us uh go through that veil of forgetting but it's still there in our subconscious or super conscious or whatever it is you know still there it's just not easy to bring it up so we you know uh we're formed we grow <laughs> through the experiences we have and the lessons we learn. And that's what life's about. That's why yeah, we're here. Yeah, yeah. I believe that. I believe that wholeheartedly. Uh, great. Um, I had, uh, this is sort of a side topic, uh, but it's something that you've uh, written about. Um, so uh, unidentified aerial phenomena or UAPs or UFOs as they uh, used to be called. So at this point we have like hundreds, if not thousands of military national security personnel who've come forward 
stories about their encounters with UAPs, you know, that footage released by the U.S. Navy uh, or or a footage from U.S. Navy pilots uh, showing this extremely fast moving, like physics defying object. Uh, what do you make of these? I know it's one it's a, it's a topic you're interested in. Like, what are these? I, uh, I am the one of the reasons I'm interested. My first boss out of college, my supervisor was a <clears throat> retired colonel in the from the air force oh and uh he had he told me one afternoon one evening over some drinks about an experience he had when he was flying a transport plane across the atlantic and he uh had a crew i think there were five or six men on board and a orb came up and flew alongside the cockpit for a half an hour and then went psh, off uh, to the right, you know, in a way that, as you said, physics defied. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said he filed a report with the, uh, you know, with his superiors, and that was the last he ever heard of it. Wow. But uh, I think that they are, some of them at least, uh, from other dimensions coming here to, to visit us and check us out. And I believe that they must respect the idea of free will and, and want to allow us to develop uh, as we're going to develop, but uh, that they're kind of waiting and watching to see if we're going to go through this transformation that you and I've just been talking about into where we realize that we're, we're not our bodies, that we're the, these uh, uh, spiritual beings, eternal spiritual beings having the physical experience. And then maybe we'll be able to uh, you know, get to be friends with them. I don't think necessarily they're all good guys, but uh, I think probably the vast majority of them are and that they are coming in. And the reason they're able to defy physics is because they've got a different kind of physics where they're from. And, uh, you know, I've had, I've read where people explain ways they might be able to do these maneuvers where it's uh, really gravity that uh, that is uh, different around their machines. But uh, to me, it makes more sense that they're really, and even if that's the case, that they're from, from different dimensions. And that's how they get here. They just, they can come in, <laughs> everything is connected. So yeah. it's a matter, uh, that's kind of what I think anyway. What do you think about it? Do you, have you thought about it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I think the same thing. It's like, uh, I think I heard this uh, analogy one time. It's kind of like, uh, you know, we're three dimensional, right? If we go into a two dimensional space, you know, that that if there's a being on that two dimensional space, they won't be able to tell how we got there, right? It, it will, we will just sort of intrude on their, <laughs> on their. Uh... <laughs> and that's what this UFO or what do they call them now? Uh, oh, right. UAPs. I, I still think, yeah, I still call them UFOs. <laughs> right. But, well, yeah, yeah, they just sort of appear and then they disappear. They they can go just as fast underwater as they go above water and so on. Yes. Yes. That was actually, uh, that was one of the accounts that I was uh, uh, listening to a couple of days ago was uh, this female uh, Navy pilot who was explaining uh, this UFO that was moving underwater just seamlessly, like there, there was no resistance from the water itself. You know? right, it's, right. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. So it's got to be something to do with the other dimension, I think. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. And, and one last question I had for you, Stephen, is about, uh, book publishing actually, because I, uh, I was, uh, I was looking on your website and I saw that, uh, that obviously you've, published many, many books, and uh, you help others to do so as well? Is that right? Well, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, what I'm, you know, I was in the advertising business for, for many, many years, and uh, now what I've been doing the last five or six years, although I started it 20-some years ago, uh, I started a small press. Actually, I think it was founded in 1995, and uh, yeah, I'm looking for books to publish that, uh, uh, and they can be anything from novels to self-help to metaphysical books. I've, I've published some, uh, one of the books that's doing very well 
uh, that I published recently is a book called uh, Code Blue. Of course, in a hospital, you know what Code Blue is. And uh, it's uh, a preach a minister who's looking at near-death experiences and relating it to passages in the Bible where he feels that the Bible supports the near-death accounts that have been given. Because a lot, a lot of Christians, you know, kind of look at that near-death thing with skepticism. They don't think it's biblical. But he's, his argument is that, yes, it is. In fact, he points out that the Apostle Paul apparently had a near-death experience because he describes, Paul describes it in one of his passages. Oh. But, uh, so, but I've also uh, just I published a novel recently uh, called Love, Caribbean Style. <laughs> <laughs> murder mystery that took takes place in the uh, uh, late 1940s that uh, just came out and this wow. I'm not that I wrote that I've, I, I edit and if it needs editing I edit and uh, you know I do the design the covers and the interiors and I've got accounts set up with uh, Amazon and Ingram and the other companies that just sell and distribute books so yeah, it's uh, you can go to my website and learn about that. Or the name of the business is Oakley, spelled O A K L E A Press. O the Oakley Press, and the website is oakleypress.com. O A K L E A. Kind of a strange spelling, but when I started the company, I had my little office uh, on a on a state here in Virginia that was called Oakley. I think it's the Lee side of the oak is what that means. But Oh, fascinating. No, that's... Means, you know, Google my full name, Stephen Holly Martin. Probably my website will come up at the top or near the top. Absolutely. Or just shmartin.com. Shmartin.com is my website. And I'll make sure to uh, put all the links in the description as well, whether you're listening to this on... Uh, Google, Apple, Spotify, wherever, <laughs> or watching this on YouTube, I'll have uh, all the links in the description as well. Perfect. I'm definitely going to let my wife know she's a, she's a writer. She writes poetry, so I think uh, she might be interested. So. Yeah, sure. <laughs> We've got all kinds of books, all kinds, you know, biographies, Historical novels, romance novels, <laughs> uh, self-help, metaphysics. Love it. On and on. We got a bunch. Love it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check out that Code Blue. Uh, that's fascinating. Uh, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Well, Stephen, this was a wonderful conversation. Uh, I just wanted to thank you again for being here. I truly appreciate you giving me and our listeners a ton to think about and. Uh, hopefully we can have a conversation like this again in the future. Very good. I'd, I'd like to. Thank you so much, Bruce. All right, folks, that's it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed this conversation with the awesome Stephen Holly Martin. As always, if you have thoughts on the topics we discussed, feel free to comment below. This is Dr. Prashant Sharma signing off from Finding Aum. That's A-U-M, Awareness, Understanding, and Mastery a YouTube channel about combining mental health and spirituality to live a more meaningful life. See you next time.